This week's Sadra is in, in Chutzlar, it's is uh, Korach, and the first passing in Korach is Vayika Korach ben Yitzchak ben Tzahas ben Levi ben Das ben Badriyam ben Eliab ben Ben Pelos ben Eruvain Vayikumul of Nei Moshe Vanoshim Nei Yisrael Chamishim Masayim Mesia Eda Kuei Moed Anche Shem. So it says Vayika Korach. Korach took. The Torah doesn't tell us what Korach took. So Rashi suggests two explanations. One explanation Rashi suggests is that Korach took himself, he separated himself from Klal Yisrael to lead a rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu. The other suggestion that Rashi makes is Vayika Korach, that Korach took Moshech Rashi Sanhedrios. He took 250 leaders of Sanhedrin. Korach apparently it was a person who was able to have a, a bad influence on people who were leaders. And he was able to draw 250 Rashi Sanhedrios, leaders of Sanhedrin, to join him in his rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu. But the problem is, the Torah doesn't say that. The Torah just says, Vayikach Korach. Korach took. Why didn't the Torah tell us what Korach took? Apparently, there is a special message in, in the statement of Vayikach Korach. Now, the... the uh, the, the Rashi mentions that where Korach was, where Korach was situated, his tent was close to Bnei Ruve, and it is, was because he was close to the tribe of Ruve in terms of where he camped, where his tent was. Because of that, Korach had an impact on many within the Ruvain tribe. And he drew people from the Ruvain tribe as followers of his. Now, when you take a look, who were the leaders in the Ruvain tribe that joined Korach? It was Dosan Vaviram B'nei Eliyav. And now, Dosan Vaviram, they are scoundrels from day one, even before day one. They lead rebellion against Moshe, even in Egypt yet. And we say, Woe to the wicked, that's Korach. Woe to his neighbor, as a result of his influence, that's the people from the tribe of Ruvain under the leadership of Dosan Vavira. Now, Korach, this is the first time we see in the Torah that Korach is identified with a rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu, whereas Dosan Vavira are constantly involved. They're troublemakers. Wherever there is a fight, Das and Vavir there. So how is it that Chazal, our sages, say, Ayla Rasha, meaning woe to the wicked, Korach. Ayla Shechena, woe to those who he has an influence on, his neighbors, Das and Vaviram. Das and Vaviram were Rishoyim, Mitchilos and Batsofam. It's not here that we are introduced to them as being rebellious. They're constantly rebellious. I once heard from my father, that's all, that the reason is because Das and Vaviram were just troublemakers. Whenever there was a fight, they were involved. They were looking for fights. But Korach, he tried to make his fight as a matter of principle. Korach said, The whole nation 
is, is holy. He was speaking on behalf of the Jewish people. He was speaking on recognizing the importance of the Jewish people. He wasn't just a troublemaker. He gave an ideology into the trouble that he was creating. That's why our sages say, Ayla Russia, Olishkeno. But I think that it's important to understand what, what motivated Korach in his rebellion. Now, there is a very interesting Medrash. The Medrash takes notice of the fact that immediately before Parsha's Korach begins, we're given the Parsha Bayomer, which is the third Parsha in Kriyashma. It's the mitzvah tzitzis. And Korach said to Moshe, according to the Medrash, now the mitzvah of tzitzis has two elements to it. It has strings that, that, are, that are white, and it has strings. This, there's a discussion how many that are blue, that are made of tchelis. And the Korach asked Moshe Rabbeinu, if you have a beged, a, you have a talus that's completely blue, dyed in tchelis, so does it need strings also? Does it need tzitzis? Or it doesn't need tzitzis? In other words, Korach apparently went with the opinion, there is a discussion among the Tanayim. This medrash obviously goes according to the opinion of Rebbe, that in order to fulfill the mitzvah of tzitzis, you need both strings of tchelis and strings of lava. If you only have one, you cannot fulfill the mitzvah with the other. According to most Rishonim, we do not pask in that way. Uh, the proof is that uh, people wear tzitzis that uh, just have strings of white. Lately, many claim that they know what tchelis is. I'm not getting into that question right now. But for, for over a thousand years, uh, the, 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 everybody, everybody observed the mitzvah tzitzis without chalas. Our opinion is that even if you don't have the blue strands, you could fulfill the mitzvah tzitzis. But there is an opinion that you need both the blue strands and the white strands. Korach apparently was pushing the idea that if you don't have a requirement of blue strands, there is no requirement of white strands either uh, attached to, to the talus. So he said, if, there is, if someone wears a talus that's completely dyed in blue, Korach's feeling was that there is no purpose in adding blue strands to, to the beged, to, to the talus. And consequently, he asked Moshe Rabbeinu, is there a requirement of, when you have a, a beged that's completely blue, dyed in tchelis, does it need blue strands? And Moshe Rabbeinu said, yes, where blue strands are available, you need blue strands. Korach made fun of that, and he took the 250 Rashi Sanhedrios, the leaders of Sanhedrin, and he covered them with a talus that was completely blue without having any tzitzis attached to it. And he said to Moshe, what does a couple of blue strands add to a talus that's completely blue. 
And then he asked another question. And the reason he took Rashi Sanhedrios is because a talus is not, oh, it's not only just the tzitzis. The talus was clothes that the, that the judges used to wear. In Parshish Dvarim, Rashi says, Havuli Anashim, give me, give me judges, people to serve as judges. And Rashi says, I don't know these people. They come from your crowd, covered with their talus, and I do not know who they are. So it was customary that the judges at that time would wear a talus. So Moshe took, so Korach took the leaders of Sanhedrin, people who sat on Bezdin, Peter's people that were leaders of the Jewish people, but joined Korach in his rebellion and demonstratively put a talus that was completely blue without the strands of the tzitzis. And and this was a demonstration of rejection of the authority of Moshe Rabbeinu. And then, and that's why the Parsha of Korah comes immediately after the Parsha that tells us about the mitzvah of tzitzis. However, the Medrash mentions that Korah made another claim against Moshe. He said, if you have a house or a tent, as it might have been in those days, that was, that, that, that is Mole Sparim, that has Sifri Taurus, does it need a mezuzah on its doorway? And, and Moshe Rabbeinu said, yes, it does need. And again, Moshe, Korach ridiculed Moshe Rabbeinu. And he said, if it's Mole Sfarim, if the, if the house or the tent is full of Sfarim, what does one little mezuzah that contains two partios add to it? And now the question that Korach raised about Sitsis is very clear where it came from because the Parsha of Korach begins with, with right after the Parsha of Tzitzis, right after the portion of the Torah that talks about the myths of Tzitzis. But the question is, why does the Medrash mention that they argued also over the mezuzah, whether a bias mali svarim, a house full of sifrei Taurus, require a mezuzah. But I think it might be because uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, when they had that final confrontation, uh, the final confrontation, so that's in Perik Tezayin, Pasuk Chavzayin. So, in regard to Dosen Vavira, it says, Vayelu me'al mishkan karach Dosen Vavira, misavim v'dosen Vavira miyotsu nitzavim pesach ha'aleyem. They went out to erect at the entrance of their tent. In other words, the Pasuk says that they acted in this demonstrative manner in the entrance of their tent. So it could be that the Medrash, it's my theory, the Medrash, why did they stood demonstratively at the, at the entrance of their tent? It was to show that it had something to do with the entrance. In other words, there was no mezuzah there. So apparently they had a house that had svarim, and this was part of the demonstration and as 
that was part of the rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu. Now it's true that the Rambam in Hilchos Brachos says that a tent, uh, the Rambam in Hilchos Brachos says that a tent doesn't require a mezuzah. But the Achronim point out, that's talking about a tent that is put up, set up and put down consistently every day, every two days. You put it up and you take it down. But if a tent is allowed to stay up for an extended period of time, then it requires a mezuzah. So, but we have to understand, what was the argument? The logical argument, the philosophical argument between Korach and Moshe. Now, there is a famous shir that my uncle gave. I've seen different versions of it. And I'm going to say, say over part of that shir where I read it. My uncle pointed out that there are three forms of knowledge. This Chachma, Bina, and Das. What is Chachma? Chachma is wisdom. Chachma is acquired knowledge. Acquiring facts. Bina, that's Maven Dover Mitoch Dover. That's deductive knowledge, deductive ability. You have certain people that they have tremendous memories. And everything they see, they read, they hear, it remains with them. That's Chachma. Bina is to deduce one fact from another fact. That's, that's a, a form of thinking. But then there's Das. What is Das? Okay, the Medrash very often says Das means Ruach HaKodesh. But the simple explanation of Das means common sense. We say a Shota. Someone who uh, does not act in a normal manner, he sleeps in a cemetery, he loses everything he gets, that it, it, it is not a bar das, it's not a person who has das. You can have people like that that are great geniuses, but they're lacking common sense. So das means common sense. What was Korach's argument, my uncle said? My uncle said that Korach's argument was Moshe, you are not special. In the midst of the Jewish people is God. In other words, you're not more of authority when it comes to Jewish law and Jewish practice than any other Jew. Korach certainly would not deny Moshe's knowledge or Moshe's thinking ability. But my uncle, one of the Shirab said, it's a very funny thing. When people need medical attention, they go to a doctor. A doctor's knowledge, he has chachma, he acquired knowledge, he has bina, he's able to juice some doctors, one thing from another, You don't go to a doctor. Of course, a doctor has to have common sense also. But, but when you have a medical problem, 
you don't go, you don't, ex, you don't, you don't think, you don't go, you don't arrive at a conclusion how to uh, to treat the medical problem on the basis of common sense. Things have to be tested. Things have to be evaluated. We see with the coronavirus, how much testing is going on over the whole world. Sometimes you see people, unfortunately, who have cancer, that they think up of their own remedies that's not based on any scientific method, that there was no testing for it. And some even go into business selling these uh, cures. So everybody understands when you want to build a house, yes, you need common sense in building a house. But if you build a house on just on the basis of common sense, without any knowledge of architecture, without any knowledge of building, the house won't last long, even if you're able to put it up. Everybody understands that common sense itself in every area is not sufficient. There has to be acquired knowledge. But for some reason, when it comes to religion, there everybody became an authority. My uncle in one of this year would mention about the ritual committees. People who had no knowledge of halacha. No knowledge of, of the Mesorah, of what was transferred over from generation to generation. All of a sudden they think that they are halachic authorities as well. And that's what Korach, that was Korach's program. Kol ha'eda kulam doshi. Everybody, of course all Jews are holy. But Korach was taking that fact to say that when it comes to religion, Religion is not like the other areas of knowledge. In the other areas of knowledge, we know a person has to acquire knowledge to be an authority. Religion, anybody could do, be an authority. And on the basis of common sense, Korach's arguments were very valid. On the basis of common sense, if you have a beget, a talus, that's completely dyed in blue, kulo trelis, what does a string or a couple strings of blue add to it? Tchelis don aliyam. The Tchelis reminds us about the sea. The sea uh, it reminds us about the heavens. The heavens reminds us about the Kisei HaKavot. Why is it that, why should that be any different whether the Begit is blue or, or you have a, a blue strand? What does the blue strand add? To a begit that's blue. And the the so that was the argument. And the same thing was true about the mezuzah. From the point of view of common sense, what does the mezuzah add to a house that has Sifre Taurus, that has sparim? 
even if they didn't have Sifri Torahs at that time, the Medrash Rabbah and Shemos mentions that the Jewish people had Megillos, even in Egypt. So what does it add? That was Korach's claim. But I want to suggest another possible explanation of regarding the Talis, what was Korach's argument. Now, the mitzvah of tzitzis is to put tzitzis, to put the strands, the strings, whatever you want to call them, at the four on a four cornered garment. What does four corners represent? Four corners represents everywhere. In a sense, the way I would understand the mitzvah of tzitzis, amidst the mitzvah of tzitzis, the strands of tzitzis, in a sense, it represents our being tied to God. God is everywhere. And the tzitzis at the four corners of the garment ties us to God. And what's the idea? The idea, I think, is that the Jewish people, on one hand, they're the children of God. On the other hand, they're the servants of God. We had a fast day. Aser Shimei Tshuva. We speak of Vino Malkeno. On one hand, God is our Father, and we are His children. I know today is Father's Day. Uh, on the other hand, we are the servants of God, and God is our Master. And a master who we accept upon ourselves, which makes him our king. Tchelis, the blue strand, that is the symbol of Malchus. That is the symbol of royalty. Royalty is the the uh, royalty is the the uh, and the Mordechai when 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 he goes out when he becomes the assistant to the king in Persia Pachashverosh so among the things he wears is Tchelis so the Jewish people being the children of God. We, we are royalty. On the other hand, we are also servants of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The tzitzis, as opposed to a begging, the strings, that's being tied to God. A servant is tied to his master. Korach wanted royalty without servitude. But we know that our royalty has to come together with our servitude, with, together with being the servants of God. And this is why this was the argument of Korach. It's very interesting. When you take a look at leadership in general, when Moshe defends his leadership, when he's challenged by Korach, 
So he says, did I ever take anything from anybody? Did I, did I ever take anything from anybody? And in the Haftorah of this week, Shmuel Hanavi, who was a descendant of Korach, when the people demanded a king, Shmuel Hanavi defends his leadership and says, did I take anything from anybody? If I ever took anything from anybody, let them stand up and say so now. Why? Because Moshe and Shmuel Hanavi understood that leadership manifests itself in a sense in servitude, in giving. Whereas Korach understood leadership from the perspective of taking. And it's because of that he wanted only a beggar kulashal chalis. He didn't want strings of blue, which, which identifies being dependent and taking and giving, requirement to give. So, and this is how Korach worked with the members of Sanhedrin. He worked on them with the idea, you people, you are leaders. Leaders have to take. Leaders take. Leaders don't have to give. And the whole Sefer of Rus, it talks about Elimelech. Elimelech, Chazal tell us, Eli Melech. Elimelech felt that he was royalty. He was the king of the Jewish people. But then there was a famine in the land. And when there was a famine in the land, he abandoned the people. Why? Because the position of leadership in those circumstances didn't offer him the opportunity to take. He had to give. And he had Korach's perspective of leadership. Korach's perspective of leadership was Leadership was a position that offered me the opportunities of taking. It didn't place upon me responsibilities of giving. And, and, and but, when we see, take a look at Rus, how she gives to Naomi, she takes care of Naomi, and Boaz is constantly giving. Boaz gives, gives to Naomi, to Rus. He offers, he often tells, even before, when he first meets her, he offers her dignity. He tells her to eat together with his workers. And Boaz was also a leader, but it was a different type of leadership. It was the leadership of giving rather than taking. It was lead, leadership that came with the idea that one not only, that, that, that leadership manifests itself in giving rather than taking, just taking. And and this was this this was the uh, uh, so this is why the Torah tells us a yikach Korach that Korach took, and it doesn't say what Korach took. Rashi explains it. The Torah Shabbal explains it, but the Torah is telling us something about the personality of Korach. The personality of Korach is by yikach Korach. Korach took. What did Korach take? Korach took whatever he could take because that was his personality. And that's why he desired leadership. 
And because he desired leadership of that nature, he wanted a begit that's kulo shal that the begit itself showed royalty. But he didn't feel any responsibility, not to God and not to the Jewish people. And the strings represent servitude a servant has to give. Jewish leadership has to come together with servitude. And I think the same thing could be said. The same thing could be said about the, the mezuzah. Abai Yismole Svarim. If somebody has a library, you have many scholars. They can use, I remember someone told me that uh, they were talking with my father's cousin, Rabdavid Soloveitchik, uh, in Yerushalayim many years ago. And they were asking Rabdavid about a certain relative of his, that that uh, that happened to teach Talmud in the university, and Reb David was not impressed with that person. The person apparently had a name as being a scholar, I assume at the Hebrew University. I, I wouldn't have expected Reb David to be impressed with the person, but Reb David said, first of all, he he's not impressed with his knowledge or anything, but more than that, he says it's not Torah. It's not Torah. What's the idea it's not Torah? In other words, you could study Torah as if it was history. You could study Torah as if it was philosophy. But if you want to study Torah as Torah, it's an altogether different perspective. If you study Torah as Torah, it's, it's the idea of Misora. A giving over from generation to generation. Of course, it's the idea of, in a sense, uh, how does one come to love HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Medrash says, Histakel Ba'olomo, Histakel B'Taraso, closeness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. But if you study Torah only as an intellectual pursuit, I mean, even according to the definition of Reb Chaim Balazhner of Torah Lishma, but if it's only intellectual pursuit, it's not a religious pursuit, then it's not Torah. It could be history, it could be sociology, it could be psychology, but Torah it's not. So, when you take Shema and Bahayim Shemoa, and you give that special distinction, as the mezuzah does, on the doorway of the house, so it's not just part of an intellectual study. It represents Kabbalah Omal Cheshemayim, the acceptance of the yoke of heaven. That was the argument over the mezuzah. By your small svarim, you can have a library full of svarim. And they could be Sifrei Kodesh. And you can study every letter in every one of those volumes. But you will not have studied one word of Torah. It's only if the Torah is part of a Kabbalah soul that it, that it is Kabbalah Sat Torah. That it's Torah. And Korach's attitude was that I can use Torah for my own purposes. 
There was no Kabbalah soul. He was not acceptance. The yoke of heaven. He says, Kol kulam Hashem. In other words, the Jewish people can mold the halacha to meet the needs of the time and of the situation and their common sense approach. There are those who advocate it because we know that minna custom plays a major role in halacha. When there is a custom that certain opinions are considered to be accepted. But there are those today, and this began even within orthodoxy probably 40, 50 years ago. There are those that advocated that, that if you want to change halacha, you get the custom to change. And once the custom changes, then there will be an obligation to try to explain it within the halakha. Minog only plays a role because there's an assumption if the minog is a certain way, certain opinions became accepted. It's not because there is a custom that opinions became accepted. It's the very reverse. The custom is evidence as to which opinion became accepted. We don't formulate the opinions to accommodate the custom. Especially if we know that the custom originated from a non-halachic foundation. There is no accommodation in halacha. Halacha has to be based on searching for the truth. How could the common man as Korach wanted to make change halacha? The way the people will practice, that will become the halacha. As someone told me once, I mentioned to a certain rabbi that we're arguing about uh, certain shilas, about new approaches, and how, how to give a get, chas v'shalom, there are people that were advocating giving a get where the husband doesn't play a role. I said to him, let's say you think you're right. Do you really think that you're helping the lady out? No one is going to accept it. And he said, yes, eventually people will accept it. The idea was all we have to do is change the custom. And then the halacha will be manipulated. That was the approach of, of Korach. The approach of Moshe is Moshe Emes and Karasu Emes. We have to search for the truth. And when there is a custom, we assume that that custom developed as a result of people recognizing certain shittas as being the true shita. And in different forms, the Machlokas, Korach Vadaso, continues to this day. And we have to stand firm and say what even Korach came to realize later. Moshe Emes with the wrestlers. Okay.
Mr. Coyle, thank you very much. If anyone has questions, please write them in the uh, chat bar, in the chat, and I'll ask them. Okay. Okay, uh, one question is, can, can we compare Korach's rebellion with other movements in Jewish history like Shabzai Tzvi and what some of our leaders do today? I'm sure, uh, yes. <laughs> I think that was my main point. Uh, and Sha I, I don't know, as far as Shabzai Tzvi is concerned, uh, I, I, I would think so. Uh, Shabzai Tzvi was really went against the Rabbanim and all that, yeah. Not that he didn't have a couple on his side, but, uh, but uh, for sure, uh, that's, that's correct, yes. Anything else, any other questions? I, I'm gonna paraphrase this, but uh, okay. I, I guess it's saying, are, do you think certain historical people were Gilgulim of Korach? <laughs> that's not exactly what the question is but that's the idea of it uh certainly not uh, I, I i as far as the actual gilgal's concerned i know very little so i'm not even going to suggest but the, the, do i think that some people are motivated by the philosophy of korach uh, yes, I do believe that some have similar philosophies at the Korach. You know, that uh, those who believe halacha could be changed to meet the needs of the time, so they are adopting uh, to a certain degree the Korach approach. It's uh, you know. And I I don't want to say any names, but a certain person who used to be the head of uh, Mahon Harry Fischel many, many, many uh, decades ago, he uh, he was opposed to changing halacha, wasn't he? That would be my assumption. My That'd assumption is thing, yeah. I, I'm not aware that he tried to change halacha. Uh, I'm not aware of any cases that he tried to change halacha. But, uh, he, he may not have been the biggest defender, but he certainly didn't want to change. Well, I I'm, not, not, I, I'm not aware that he wanted to change the law. Okay. Um, how do you know if a request to change a minute is Lashem Shemayim when everyone says that they're Lashem Shemayim? <laughs> <laughs> to change a minute? Yeah, how do you know if the request to change a minhag is l'shem shemayim when everyone says they are l'shem shemayim? I, 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 it, 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 those who, about, who have to evaluate it, it's not the question of whether the person is l'shem shemayim or it's not l'shem shemayim. It has to be evaluated intellectually with chachma, bina, and das. I should point out that it's very interesting. I once mentioned it to my father. My father liked the thought very much in fact, he used it a number of times. That uh, by the Mishkan, the Torah talks about uh, those who built the Mishkan. At Chapitzalel, Chachma Bina Vedas, or Haskel, whatever. So, but it's Das. The simple explanation, of course, the uh, Rashi says it means Ruach Hakodesh. But the, those who say that Das means common sense. You would have expected Das to be first and then Chacham and Bina. And I suggested to my father that Das, which is common sense, is an intuitive uh, feeling, uh, an intuitive understanding, an intuitive ability to explain. There's a difference between common common sense and common sense that emanates from Chachma and Bina. And uh, so B'Tzalel not only had the common common sense that everybody has, but his, his common sense was impacted by his, uh, by his Chachma and Bina as well. And then a follow-up to that, which is from my question, is that I, I know a certain person who obviously didn't uh, come from a brisker background. He was critical of uh, of brisk in regard to people trying to do things to fulfill more shittas because they were changing the minhag. It's like, we had a minhag. Why do you have to do that? 
<laughs> well, first of all, uh, minhag, minhag is only one criteria in determining halacha. But the Engla Dayan Elamash ain't of Rose. So if somebody, if somebody has, if someone feels that on the basis of his knowledge and his understanding of the halacha, the halacha is a certain way, so then, then the uh, minugs to a certain degree is pushed aside. So that's, uh, that's, so that, that's probably why in Grisk they followed that, uh, that approach. Because Engla Dayan Elamash ain't of Rose. Okay, another question. Was Korach seeking personal power or just to change halacha? The uh, way it appears to me is Korach had the attitude, I don't know, I, I'm dating myself, but the, those of us who read Animal Farm when we were in school, so uh, all animals are equal, but there are those that are more equal than the others. So I think Korach really, as the Chazal point out, he was seeking leadership. But if he came out and said, I, Korach, am the leader, I am greater than Moshe Rabbeinu, no one would have followed him. In fact, that might have been Korach, it might have had a Lundish approach. Korach's, Moshe Rabbeinu's authority, he felt, emanated from, from Klal Yisrael, from the Jewish people. So that's what he said. Their power is in the people. Moshe Rabbeinu only gets his authority from the Jewish people. So, so of course, his motivation was that he said, all animals are equal. But the problem is, he, he really wanted to say there are animals that are more equal than others. We could also say that the Medrash about uh, the wife of Own Ben Pelas, she saw that, that you know, she saw the that, that's right. that's that that's Korach was right. going to be the only winner. Everyone that's else right. who rebelled with him was not going to be idea, a leader. Same, right. same, same idea, same idea. Okay. That's, yeah. Um, it's scary. Here's another question. It's scary to think that so many of those with the highest supposed or perceived standing as Torah personalities could have been so easily deceived. I assume that's referring to the 250 heads of Sanhedrin. Is or has there been a repeat of this experience in the recent observant community, even if it's only unintentional? I, well, my guess is that you have to understand this was in the initial period of, uh, of, uh, of, of the of Jewish history. And in addition, and then in, in Parsha's Dvarim, Moshe Rabbeinu says, he asked, he asked the people to present, to give them, to present to him the leaders. He says, I really don't know the people. They come to me with their talus, as I mentioned. They come to me with their talus over the head. I don't really know who they are. You know who they are. So it's possible that some of these people that some of these people were, were uh, uh, so, so, some, some of these people that were presented were really not worthy of the positions that they originally got. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know them. But then there's another thing. You find that when, uh, let's say, the Miraglim, the Miraglim uh, were Rashi B'nai Yisrael Heima. They were leaders of the Jewish people. And Rashi tells us that when they, they left, they were Anush and Tzadikim, they were righteous people. And all of a sudden, when they entered Eretz Yisrael, they formed this plot of rebellion against Moshe Rabbeinu and against HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So how are we to understand it? But the answer is, you find people that are great people, great Tzadikim, within a given milieu, within a given situation. But when the situation changes, sometimes, unfortunately, commitment crumbles. And it's possible that their, 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 their commitment, their commitment, they were Anoshim Tzadikim, 
but so long as they were close to Moshe Rabbeinu. In a similar sense, the Jewish people at the time of Deigel Hazav, Moshe Rabbeinu goes up to Har Sinai. Uh, Forty days later, the Jewish people stand in front of an, a, a golden calf and say, Elu Elahecha Yisrael. Forty days earlier, they said, Nasa Benishma. They were, they were on a level higher than Malachim. But what happened? The situation changed. And in our time, in our time, we've had also situations change. We had situations change as a result of World War II. So, and it could be, this is just after the, the situation of Miraglam. The Jewish people were looking forward to entering Eretz Yisrael at any minute. And all of a sudden, they're told they're going to be killed out. They're all going to die in the desert. They're never going to reach that goal that sustained them. And that situation could sometimes lead people to act in an irrational manner. So that's, uh, that's how I would understand it. So... So I think if I could summarize that, I think one thing you're saying is that there wasn't a Misora of Misora yet at That's the time. Right. So That's that right. was one reason that the, the thing. And then the other thing is uh, perhaps you could say because each uh, tribe had to set up their own Sanhedrins. So the people had a, had appointed these people, their Sanhedrins, even though Moshe didn't know them so well. So That's they were, right. so maybe you know, to an extent, the way we say in the Declaration of Independence, uh, what receiving their, their by consent of the governed, uh, no, my uh, de deriving their power so by the consent of the governed that they became heads of the Sanhedrin because the other people from their tribe wanted them. That's right. So I'll maybe they would, yeah. maybe they wouldn't have been the prototypical leaders, but since their tribes chose them, they were. Well, I, I, I would, uh, I'm more inclined to say, well, you might be right, but I'm more inclined to say that people see things in a given milieu, in a given situation, but it takes a, a, a greater understanding to understand what happens if the situation changes, how will he react to the changing situation? Right, and sometimes... And the people at that time were not yet at that position or had that ability to make that determination. Right, and maybe going back to that question also, sometimes, you know, there's someone like a Korach who gets these people to follow him. Sometimes uh, there's, you know, a skunum around someone who try to tilt the message coming out also. <laughs> okay, that's for sure, for sure. Uh, okay. okay. Here's a tough question. I don't know if, uh, how do we identify the Moshe or, or the Korach of our era? <laughs> I think it's a tough question. But you, you might have a simple it answer. It's a, it's a lot easier to identify the Korach of our era than the Moshe of our era. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then uh, a last question about uh, yeah. Minhag changing or... Um, and this is virus related is for many, but going back to the Gemara, there's a uh, Minaka Sochrim that the fact that people uh, shake hands to consummate a deal, making a handshake is a halachically uh, recognized symbol of Kenyan with the yeah. fact that the virus now and people are not doing handshakes anymore. Would that uh, affect the, uh, well, they never heard of gloves. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think so. If it was only a situational thing. Uh, Meaning the, because the, the virus is causing people to not do handshakes, it's not that they don't want to do handshakes anymore. Yeah, yeah okay. right. it's, uh, it's not that, it's not, it hasn't passed that amount of period of time that it should lose its, uh, right. it, it, its identification. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And okay. uh, for anyone who wants to see the previous shiurim or the upcoming shiurim, just su search Rabbi Moshe Salvechik on YouTube. The channel is, uh, I think it's my name, the same way you see it here. Uh, and today's share will hopefully be up uh, a little bit later today. Thank you, everyone. And Yashikach, Rabbi, thank you very much. Bye.